All right, hello students. Uh, welcome to your first pre-calc video lesson. Today we're gonna be talking about um, rational functions and um, inverse variation, if you guys remember anything uh, about that from Algebra 2. We're gonna be working on problems 15, 16, and 17 in uh, chapter five, which you guys can find on page 233, 233 of your textbooks. Um, today's gonna mostly be review of uh, looking at graphs of rational functions or inverse variation functions where we have our x variable on the bottom, okay? So, uh, for example, this, uh, this function here, y equals one over x, I have graphed right here. Um, I've graphed for you the asymptotes of this graph as well. So remember that an asymptote is uh, a line that we get very, very close to or approach, but we do not cross. Um, in this particular case, those two asymptotes are our y-axis and our x-axis. So I've marked those sort of in red dashes here. These are the lines that I can approach, but we'll never uh, get to cross. So in the original parent function, which we should have in our parent function notes, y equals one over x, um, those asymptotes are always x equals zero and y equals zero. Um, so I might put that in here, x equals zero is that asymptote, and then this asymptote here is y equals y equals zero. Okay, so we have these two asymptotes, and then we have sort of what I call like, you know, two whoops, uh, on either side of the asymptotes. So when we have one over X, um, remember that this point right here is at one in the X and one in the Y because one times one is one. So remember our X and our Y values that make our coordinate points always multiply to be this top number uh, right there, okay? That top number right there is our, uh, how we find our coordinate points. So again, here we have negative one and negative one. And then for this particular parent graph, the rest of them are all fractions. So we're not gonna necessarily go over that. Um, but if for example, you had uh, four over X, you could make points at one comma four, you could make points at two comma two, sorry, bad two four comma one, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just making coordinate points that multiply to be that top number again, okay? Um, so this is a graph that, like I said, we should have in our notes um, somewhere. Whoops, my asymptote just went away, but I'm gonna put it back. Um, and what we're gonna just briefly go over is what it looks like to shift these. Now I know that that's something that a lot of us are comfortable with as well, um, but if we, for example, took away uh, that, put the one back up there. If I added on to this function, uh, if I extended this line maybe a little bit and put a minus two down here with the X, and then at the end I put a plus one. Now I have this same parent graph, but it's been shifted. Right, it's been shifted to the right by two units. It's been shifted up by one unit. So that changes my asymptotes. That changes essentially where my zero, zero point is um, or where I think about it being. So to shift to the right by two, um, obviously these, this vertical asymptote would shift over by two as well. And so my new vertical asymptote would be over here at y equals two. Maybe I'll do that in blue. So we're talking about this guy being my vertical asymptote right here. Okay, so that would be my vertical asymptote at x equals two because of this right here, because x minus two on the bottom of this function, that shifts my asymptote to the right by two. And then the plus one at the end is gonna change my horizontal asymptote. So instead of y equals zero, um, it's now gonna be y equals a positive one because it's gonna shift up here. So I'm gonna end up with this as my horizontal asymptote. Well, that's not very horizontal, but that's okay. Um, all right, so I have these, 
x equals 2 is this asymptote now, and y equals 1. These are my new vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So again, uh, where these asymptotes meet, right in the middle here, this is essentially my 0, 0 point now. And then I just shift all of the coordinate points I used to have over as well. So uh, let's see, I'll do that in this. So if I plot a point one over and one up from that new origin, and then one over and one down, that's actually gonna be right here at one zero. And then my function is gonna look exactly the same as it did. It's gonna go up towards this asymptote, but never touch it, down towards the horizontal asymptote, but never touch it. And then the same thing in the negative direction, it's gonna go up towards that asymptote, but not ever touch it, and down towards this asymptote, but not ever touch it. Okay, um, so with this in mind, um, what number 15 is asking you guys to do, um, which you can do um, sort of separately, is they're actually asking us to do this function, one over x plus two, and then at the end, they would like a plus three. Okay, so one over x plus two plus three, and that shift, of course, is to the left by two units, and up by three units. Okay, so our new origin or our new asymptote intersection is gonna be left two, so negative two in the X and positive three in the Y. Okay, so that's number 15, just a quick review of this uh, idea of shifting these uh, rational or inverse variation functions and changing their asymptotes and understanding uh, how that works, okay? So if we go on then to number uh, 16, I'm gonna clear all this stuff out of here. And in number 16, they give us uh, a new function, okay, which doesn't exactly look like the type of function that we just saw, okay? It's not just a shifted inverse variation function. Um, and so they give us this function g of x is equal to, and then they go x plus two, over, oops, I'd rather that be in black, over, and then underneath that we have x minus one. Okay, so I have this function now, g of x equals x plus two over x minus one. And again, this doesn't really seem like the type of graph that we were just looking at, but it can actually be rewritten in exactly that same form. Okay, so we're gonna talk now about how do we rewrite these in that particular form, okay? So what I want you guys to notice is that on the bottom of the fraction, I have an entire binomial, right? I have X minus one. So what I would like to be able to see is an X minus one on the top of this function as well. If I can see an X minus one on the top, I can do some splitting and some simplifying um, and you'll see a number um, sort of come out, that will be our upshift. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this uh, function and I'm gonna change the top of the fraction to say x minus one. Okay, I'm gonna change it to say x minus one, but I don't really wanna change like overall what the top of this fraction is saying. So I still need whatever's on the top to essentially be x plus two but I want it to include an X minus one because that's the bottom of my fraction. So the question is what else do I need on the top to make it actually equal X plus two even though I'm looking at something with an X minus one, okay? So what I want you to think of is how can I make this denominator piece, this X minus one into an X plus two, okay? And the easiest way to do it is simply to add three at the end. Okay, because x minus one plus three is x plus two. Okay, and again, that's still over this x minus one piece from the denominator. Okay, so now that I, I can see my denominator piece also in the numerator here, x minus one, x minus one. So the good news is whenever we have things added together in the top of a fraction, we can always split it up, right? Like uh, for example, when we have x, plus three over seven, we can make that into x over seven 
plus three over seven, right? And we're gonna do exactly the same kind of thing here. Okay, I'm gonna take this x minus one over x minus one, and I'm gonna split that off by itself. So I'm gonna go x minus one over x minus one. That's a bad one, there we go. And then I'm gonna plus this other piece of my numerator, which is a three, over that same denominator. Okay, so I'm splitting up this fraction over the same denominator, three over x minus one. Okay, and so now again, we should recognize that this piece on the left, x minus one over x minus one, that can simplify significantly, right? That can simplify down just to one. And then I still have plus three over x minus one, plus three over x minus one. Okay, so now we should be seeing the type of function that we just graphed, right? Our, our top number, our numerator is not a one this time, it's a three, so that would change some of our coordinate points. Uh, but in terms of asymptotes, hopefully we can see them now because it doesn't matter if I have one plus three over x minus one, or if you prefer, we just go three over x minus one plus one, right? We just move this plus one to the back side over here, and then we have uh, this function. So remember that this is still g of x, g of x equals, three over x minus one plus one, and that is a function that we can graph, right? Um, so when we see rational functions like this, where there's variables on the top and bottom, like polynomials in both, what we wanna try to do is make the numerator have the denominator as part of it, okay? So we just look at the denominator and say, okay, if I need an x minus one in the numerator, what else do I need to make the numerator what it's supposed to be, okay? So uh, keep that in mind when you see rational functions like this because you will be expected to graph things like this and the best way to do it is to just rewrite the numerator so that you can uh, then simplify and see this number come out, this, this vertical shift, right? In this case, a shift up of one. Um, all right, so we'll pause there for just a second and then we'll go on to number 17 um, and then uh, we'll, we'll try to look at this in a little bit different way. We'll take a graph and try to write a function that looks like this uh, to do that. Okay, so here's the graph that in number 17 we're shown and asked to find um, a possible function for the graph. Basically, a function like the ones we've been looking at that makes sense for this particular graph right here, okay? So if, if we're being asked to write a function, makes sense uh, to start our function y equals, so I'm gonna start our function y equals. Now, based on the way this graph looks and the type of graph that it is, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna need some sort of uh, fraction, right? Probably with an x in the denominator, um, and then possibly a shift up, down, left, right, something like that, okay? So the first thing that I want you to notice is where are the asymptotes, okay? Where are the asymptotes? My vertical asymptote is here at x equals three, and then my horizontal asymptote uh, is here at y equals two. Okay, so I have these two asymptotes, x equals three and y equals two. And these asymptotes are gonna give me a lot of information about this function that I'm trying to write. Um, specifically, this x equals three vertical asymptote is telling me what the denominator of my fraction needs to be. Okay, so x equals three tells me that the denominator of this fraction needs to say x minus three. Okay, because that is a shift to the right by three units. And shifting from the zero, zero, remember in the parent function, the original, it was supposed to be x equals zero, but it shifted to the right by three units. Okay, so now it's at x minus three to the right by three units. This y equals two tells me at the end of my function, at the end of my function, I need to see a plus two. 
whoops, plus two. Because this horizontal asymptote was supposed to be at zero, zero, but it's been shifted up by two units. So I need to see something in my equation that would shift the entire thing up by two units. So I put that plus two on the end. I put the minus three here underneath. Okay, and then I want you to notice uh, where these two black points are, okay? And specifically where they are in relation to the origin, okay? So the origin right here, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say the origin. Where those two black dots are in relation to the intersection of my asymptotes. The intersection, in the intersection of my asymptotes is what I consider to be the origin, quote unquote, of this function. So from this intersection of my two asymptotes, this black dot, I believe, is to the left by one space and up by one space, right? It's to the left by one and up by one. So essentially, that is, uh, let's see, I went negative one on the x, and then I went positive one on the y. Okay, so I went negative one in the x, and I went positive one in the y. Okay. Similarly, this black point down here, bottom right, I think I did basically the same thing, but the opposite. I went positive one in the X and then I went negative one in the Y. Okay. So positive one in the X, negative one in the Y. If I multiply these numbers together, one and negative one, that's going to tell me the top of this function. Okay. So in this particular case, uh, this is actually a negative one. Okay. It's a negative one. This is a negative reciprocal function, or excuse me, uh, rational function. Because remember in my original parent function, my two whoops were supposed to be top right and bottom left, right, in this area and this area, and now they flipped. They're, they're now top left and bottom right. So that flip tells me that my number on the top must be negative. Okay, so this function right here, uh, in your book, they actually put the negative sign in front of the entire fraction and leave the one over x minus three. That's fine too, uh, but I think it's just easier to put the negative on the top of the fraction because I see that when I look at my x and y points compared to my origin, okay? So you've got a couple more problems to do just working with these rational functions and trying to manipulate them, rewrite them, um, and then one practice problem about asymptotes. So uh, go ahead and Take care of those two problems. Uh, I believe it's numbers 22 and 23. Yes, 22 and 23. Um, and then send me all of uh, that work and we'll continue on next time.